Hi, this is Brian Gruley, author of Bleak Harbor, and you're listening to the Cook Memorial Public Library broadcast. Hello and welcome to the Cook Memorial Public Library podcast. I'm your host, Nate Goss. March is Women's History Month, so we thought it would be a perfect time to bring you another episode of our Libertyville local history segment, The Past is Present, with Jenny Berry, our local history librarian. Jenny is here to talk about and celebrate some of the women in Libertyville's history and also teach us about the contributions women have always made in the development of our local community. For the sake of simplicity and brevity, she has chosen three women who made their mark on Libertyville in different ways. I think you will be both informed and inspired by the local lives Jenny has selected in this episode. So here is my conversation with local history librarian Jenny Berry. Enjoy! All right, Jenny Berry, uh, welcome back to the uh, Cook Moral Public Library podcast. Hi, Nate. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. I'm excited for this episode. Women's History Month is this month. So you've got just a few women that we're going to spotlight from the history of Libertyville. We have lots of women who have done great things in town, have been serving on boards and uh, social clubs and community organizations for as long as Libertyville has been in existence. Uh, The three that I've picked out today for this year's uh, Women's History Month are actually just women who have come to my attention in the last year through various reference questions. It turns out that two of them actually are firsts of things. Okay. um, But otherwise, there's not any particular connection between these three women. They're just representative of women in Libertyville uh, over time. Right. So by no means is this exhaustive of the firsts of women in Libertyville or even really representative of how many women have actually served the community in different ways and continue to do so. Definitely. So. So, uh, but I do think that this is great for us just to maybe talk about a few women that and, you know, you're saying these are actual questions you've received in your work yes. that you've researched a little bit. Correct. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, then why don't we just we'll just jump right in. So, what's okay. the fir- who's the first woman that you'd like to uh, talk about today? All right. Well, just before we get to the ones that uh, we're going to talk about today. Most people who know Libertyville history, when you talk about women, the first person that comes to mind is Clara Colby. Um, Clara Colby was the first woman to vote in the state of Illinois, and she was from Libertyville. This was in 1913 when women were given limited voting rights in the state of Illinois. Um, and when you say limited, what, what did that mean? So they could vote for president. They could vote on local options. Uh, which are like referendum. Um, I don't remember all the other things they could vote for, but there were some offices they couldn't vote for. Okay. Um, And uh, that information, actually, we've covered Clara Colby before, so I'm not going to talk about her today. She's in our The Past is Present blog. Okay. uh, So you can read about her. Yeah, we'll link to that in our show notes. So make sure you definitely check that out. Now, was she just, I know this isn't the one we're focusing on, but is she, did she vote in Libertyville then, or was she just from Libertyville? Right, no. um, The first election that was scheduled after this bill was passed by the state of Illinois happened to be in Libertyville. Okay. And it was a b- referendum on uh, whether there should be a new village hall or the village should pay for a new village hall. Um, and so Claire Colby was the first woman to show up that day and um, put her vote in. There were 50-some women, I believe, that voted that day. We know some about some of the other people. And actually, we have a blog post called The Second Woman to Vote in mm. Illinois, which profiles some of those women as well. All right. Well, we we'll, might as well link to that one, too. Definitely. So those check are, those show notes. both good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to talk about them today because okay. we have covered yeah. them before. Let's, let's move on yeah. then. So the women I'm going to talk about today, as you said, came to me over the last year in various ways. So the first person I'm going to talk about, her name is Dr. Geta Sweeting, S-W-E-E-T-I-N-G. So last year I was working on a presentation about Libertyville during World War I. And in a May 1917 article about the formation of a Red Cross chapter in Libertyville, there was a quote that said there was a Dr. G.C. Sweeting who has a sanatorium just north of the village. So initially I was like, what? We had a sanatorium in right, Libertyville? Yeah. What's that about? Where'd that go? Yeah, <laughs> and I assumed that Dr. G.C. Sweeting was a man, you know, biased, of, sure. of course. But as I kept reading the article, the word she kept popping out. And I thought, who is this female doctor running a sanatorium in Libertyville in 1917. And then recently, I've been actually transcribing a memoir, a memoir, unpublished memoir, by a Libertyville man that grew up in the 1920s and 1930s. And as I was typing, there was a quote that said, there was a lady doctor on the north side towards the west end of Ellis Avenue who lived alone in a large two-story frame building. She had retired from her doctor business by 1926. And I went, 
Hmm, could, Wait a could minute. It be? Wait, why do I know about a woman doctor uh-huh. in Libertyville? Um, and then I thought, okay, now it's time to dig into this a little further. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Yeah, let's Sweeting. hear it. Let's hear it. All right. So she was born in 1867 in Jackson County, Michigan, to John Cater, an engineer, and Flora Cater, a homemaker. And she graduated from the University of Minnesota College of Medicine and Surgery in 1901 with a Doctor of Psychology degree. Was it typical for a, a, a woman to be graduating from medical medical school at that time? You know, that occurred to me as well. So I looked it up a little bit, and it looked like there was women-only medical schools as early as the mid-1800s. Huh. Uh, and Elizabeth Blackwell was a British physician who actually received the first a medical degree in the United States in 1848 for a woman. Um, and by the end of the 19th century, there were 19 women's medical colleges and nine women's hospitals that had been established, and some institutions were offering coeducational programs. Yeah, right, you don't so that, think it's that early, well, right? That, but, yeah. I guess that shows my bias because yeah. I feel like whenever I think of um, women in the medical field earlier on than, say, World War One and Two, yeah. I'm thinking of nurses. Right. You know, unless it's like Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. <laughs> right, right. Well, that's about the right amount of time. Now, I did find a, a statistic that said – um, again, we're talking about around 1900. Uh, women comprise five percent of the physician workforce at nearly 7,000 physicians. Okay, um, but still, I think looking at it from today, that's just way more than I would have assumed. Sure, at yeah. that time, and I think that's partially why this Dr. Sweeting just kind of jumped out at me. Yeah, so. yeah. All right. Well, so let's let's move on then. <laughs> yeah. So, Dr. Sweeting, let's let's hear a little bit more about her. Sure. So she got her Illinois medical license in 1902. Um, she married John Sweeting, who was a well driller in 1905 after she was already a practicing physician. So by 1906, we know she was the physician in charge at the Colony Association for the Care and Treatment of Epilepsy and Kindred Nervous Conditions in Morton Park, Illinois, uh, which I think is now part of Cicero. Now, she was there for a couple of years, and then in 1911, she and her husband bought several acres north of Winchester Road in Libertyville, sort of kind of across the street from Winchester House today. Mm. I found her in the 1912 Polk's Medical Register under the Colony Association for the Care and Treatment of Epilepsy and Other Mental and Nervous Sufferers, established 1902, Capacity 16, Superintendent G.C. Sweeting, M.D., Libertyville. So it seems to me that she may have actually established this practice wow. yeah. um, in 1902 and then moved it from Morton Park to Libertyville. Close to where she lived. Yeah. Right. Well, she was living in Morton Park or Cicero at the time when she oh, was okay. running that um, there. So they just moved up this way and guess brought the, just brought the practice with it. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think her husband ran the farm. Um, he may have also been doing some um, well digging um, at the time. I know that she was associated with the National Association of the Red Cross for about 25 years. Um, and she was interested in starting the chapter here. The article about that said she was very active distributing literature and doing other personal work among people of this community. Um, but I don't know if she had any longer-term involvement with the Red Cross Red here Cross, or yeah. not. Yeah, The farm or the sanitarium property uh, was listed for sale in 1918 in the Tribune as a chicken farm. Um, so it was a farm slash sanitarium. Is that kind of what you're right, saying, or was yeah. the because I'm picturing the sanitarium was built somewhere else, but no. it's on the property. I that, think the sanitarium yeah. was just the house. Okay. I, I don't believe that there was a separate building. I mean, we think of sanitarium today, like think Winchester House. It's not a sanitarium, but you know, you kind of think of a building that was right. built for that purpose, like an institution of right. some sort. Yeah. Right. I'm envisioning the one in Libertyville. It's just the farmhouse. Yeah, and you're staying on the farmhouse. Exactly, yeah. right. And it's a way to get away if you've got a nervous condition, you're sure. out in the country. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, that's my interpretation. I, I don't have any proof of that, but sure. that's my interpretation of that. Um, but the house and the farm were sold in 1919, and um, John and uh, Dr. Sweeting moved over onto Ellis Avenue, which is still north of town, just into a, a house. She was still practicing for a while, Um as I said earlier, that manuscript said 1926 is when she retired. I'm not sure that's correct, but I would say definitely by 1940, there's no occupation given for her mm. in the census. So I'm thinking at that point she retired. Also, her husband died in uh, December of 1940, and then she moved to uh, Waukegan. And then uh, I didn't write down her death date, um, but I think it was in the 1950s, and she had no children or surviving mm. near relatives. 
And that's about all I know about her. Yeah. Um, I thought she was a, a neat lady. I'd love to know more about her. I, I don't know that it, we'll find anything else, but... Um, all right. Well, who, who we got coming up next? All right. So this next one came to me in a different manner. This was a reference question. I was working one Sunday at the reference desk, and it must have been a summer Sunday, and the Anselby Cookhouse was open for tours. And a woman had walked into the cookhouse with a um, glass uh, souvenir from the Lake County Fair, which was in um, Libertyville uh, from the 1880s until uh, 1925-ish, somewhere Mm. in there. I had seen glasses like that before. We're talking about like a kind of a little glass mug, so it's usually with a handle, um, usually inscribed Lake County Fair in the year. This one was a little different because it actually had a person's name inscribed on it. So this glass was brought to you, um, and then what? Did, there was a question around it then. Well, it was basically, who is this woman? Okay. And, uh, you know, so I looked into it, and uh, her, the name inscribed on the glass was Hattie Beam, uh, which is B-O-E-H-M. And so I pulled the obituary index, and she was in it, and we were able to get the uh, obituary off of the microfilm, and I sent it off to the woman with the, with the glass, and she was thrilled. Um, what I thought was really neat about it was not only was Hattie a lifelong Libreville resident, uh, so she would have been a child or, or a, young, a young teen probably when this glass was inscribed. Um, she was actually ended up being the first woman to be appointed to a Libertyville Village office. So she became Liberal Village Treasurer, which was basically the person keeping the books for okay. the village of Libertyville, um, in 1930, and she served for 43 years wow. in that position. All right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there was actually a, a quote um, in her obituary that said, she swore in thousands of voters, sold more vehicle tags than any other village worker, and signed millions of dollars worth of payroll checks in her years as village treasurer. Hmm. So she was a fixture. <laughs> yeah, not just a first, no. just sort of an institution itself. I you would know? think so. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, so it ends up she was born in 1896 in Libertyville to George and Elizabeth Beam. Uh, her father, George, had uh, come from Germany in the 1870s and first settled in Fremont Township. And he married Elizabeth Hurdle of Fremont Township in 1891. And then they moved their family to Libertyville in 1895 where George went into the saloon business with his brother, Joseph. Um, At one time, that saloon was called the Libertyville Sample Room. She was the fourth of five children. She had three brothers and a sister. One of the brothers died um, quite young. So she attended the local schools, and she completed high school. Um, It doesn't appear that she went on to any further education after that. We do know by 1920, she was employed as an audit clerk for the Chicago, North Shore, and Milwaukee Electric Railroad, better known to most people as the North Shore Line, which ran along what is now um, the North Shore Bike Path uh, in Libertyville up until 1963. Um, She was later in the statistical department for the railroad as well. So her brother, Otto, was village clerk in 1930 when the clerk's offices were moved from his place of business to a room in the village hall. And Hattie left her position at the North Shore Line to run the office and was appointed village treasurer. That was the only notice of her appointment in the paper. So okay. you think, oh, the first woman to blah, 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 blah. So they didn't make a huge deal of Not it. Not at all. Yeah. It was more like Miss Beam is taking over, blah, 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 blah. And, yeah, it was just in the end of the small article about the clerk's office. Yeah. Meeting, which actually might also indicate that it wasn't a big deal. Right. You yeah, know, they didn't think about it. She was qualified. Her brother was village clerk, whatever that might have to do with it. And uh, she was going to run the office. Yeah. You know? uh, she only expected to stay two years and she stayed 43. <laughs> <laughs> now, was that because she had other plans or you, you just know, don't know? Or I don't you know. Know. Um, you know, that was, again, in her um, in obituary. And she said she got stuck in the job. She said, I was so busy and the board kept asking me to stay on. Liberal being my hometown, I hated to refuse them. Um, so we know that in addition to her work with the village, she was also a member of the Guild of the Blessed Virgin, the Professional Women's Club and St. Joseph Catholic Church. It's really rare that when we're doing historical uh, research that we get a sense of a personality of a person. Mm, Unless you can find letters or diaries or something like that, you don't get an insight into the person Mm -hmm. themselves. Um, We get a little hint of it about Hattie. So I found a blurb in the newspaper in February 1922, and there was a mask or costume party, Valentine party, held in honor of the girls employed by the railroad. And in that article said, Miss Beam was awarded the prize for being the most comically dressed. So I'm thinking She's maybe she had a sense, sense of humor. humor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then she also appeared in a 1961 photo in the Chicago Tribune 
in Western wear. So she's in a cowboy hat and boots and that kind of thing, practicing a square dance that was to be performed at Libertyville's 125th anniversary celebration. So she was real into celebrating anyway. Able to have fun. Exactly. Yeah, dress up when the occasion (laughs) arrives. Right. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Um, So she passed away in 1986. There are still Beams in town. Um, Her nephew, George Beam, was on the library board Mm. when the current library building was built. Um, He also ran the family insurance uh, business until just a couple of years ago. And there's other descendants still in town as well. Anyway, I thought she was an interesting person. Um, I love to reach out to the family and learn more about her. Personality-wise, I'm sure people have memories of her in town since she was – um, here for quite some time, and again, a, a fixture. Uh, so Hattie Beam, and then we move on to our third and the last one that we're going to highlight for this Great. episode. So this one is actually a woman who is still alive. I think this is the first time in a local history program that yeah. I've talked about a living person. <laughs> um, so this person came to my attention just this past fall. Um, the Historical Society got an email from a high school student saying, I am doing a project on well-known, powerful women, and I was wondering if there had ever been a female mayor in Libertyville. Um, mm, I knew question. there had been one, but there's only been one. Um, and I didn't know much about her. Um, her name is Joanne Ekman. She served as mayor in Libertyville when I wasn't actually here. So I was born and raised in Libertyville, but I went to college. And I did the adulting thing in the city okay. for a while, right? So, and that's when so she was mayor. Yeah. I missed her being here. So I did a little bit of research. And what was nice is that uh, because she is still living, I was able to reach out to her and get a little more information that's convenient. about her. It was kind of nice. Yeah. Um, so she was originally from Buffalo, New York. And she came to Libertyville in like about 1977 or 78 with her husband and two sons. Her husband was from Morton Grove and was familiar with the area. And they just loved the small town feel, the good schools and the access to the expressways and O'Hare for work. She was serving as secretary treasurer of the James Ekman Associates, which was her husband's um, business, and also raising her children. Mm -hmm. Um, And she joined the League of Women Voters for something else to do outside the house. Um, And she was quoted later on when she said, there was a whole group of us in the league with small children. We used to hire a babysitter for all our kids, and then we'd have a meeting. Getting it done. Making it happen. Exactly. And and also other league members at the time also went on to serve on the high school board, the elementary school board, village commissions, and in state office. Mm. She also served on the board for the David Adler Center, um, which she uh, said was a labor of love. And she actually loved doing that work as well. Uh, When she was in the league, she was very active on local issues. She said Libertyville was growing and the members were interested in the impact of new development would have on schools and traffic and that kind of thing. So she had been attending various village meetings to learn more about the issues and then was encouraged to seek a position on the plan commission. So she was appointed to the plan commission in 1983. And when Andrea Moore, who was serving on the village board at the time, uh, was elected to the Lake County Board, there was an open spot as a village trustee. And Joanne moved into that position in 1984. She was then elected to a four-year village board term in 1985 at the age of 38. And then in 1989, she ran against two-term incumbent Mayor Paul Neal and fellow trustee Grant Keehan in the mayoral election. And in her campaigning, her primary goals were to update the zoning ordinances, complete village comprehensive plan, and make a better relationship between the village and the township. Um, she did win the election by about 500 votes, okay. um, unseating the incumbent. And she ended up serving two terms. She ran unopposed for her second wow. term. And during her time as mayor, now, of course, this is in conjunction with uh, the rest of the village board and, and staff, but she was the leader of the, of the board. Um, she developed the downtown plan uh, for using the TIF money. So they had implemented a, a TIF district, uh, but there wasn't a real good plan on how to use that money. And she was involved in that. Um, She was also involved in determining the reuse of village buildings. So uh, today's village hall used to be a fire station. Uh, She was involved in that building. Restoring that. Yeah, it could be used as something else. She was also involved in the upgrading and replacement of Adler Pool. And I think a lot of her work was uh, making Libreville uh, kind of a player, or at least uh, in the in the region. So she served on more than half a dozen area boards and commissions while she was mayor, including the Northwest Municipal Conference, um, for which she served on for six years and then was president for one of the years. She was chair of the Corridor Planning Council of Central Lake County, co-chair of Wisconsin Central Mayoral Task Force, also served on the Joint Action Water Agency. 
Uh, and there was one quote in one of the newspaper articles when she was leaving office that said there was the dreaded fourth week of the month when she had a meeting every night. And she said, we had a lot of pizza in our lives, but we still like it. <laughs> <laughs> so she was busy. During her time as mayor, she also saw the replacement of the village administrator, police and fire chiefs who left due to uh, retirements, I believe. She brought the VFW and the American Legion together to restore the Memorial Day ceremony, which we still have today. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's when the flags are kind exactly. of all around the, the right. park. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and they go over to the cemetery and there's a yeah. little ceremony mm-hmm. there. Yeah. Um, so she actually said her fondest memories were um, speaking with scouts and going to schools and talking about her role in government and kind of planting the seeds of community involvement. Yeah. In November of 1996, one of the trustees, Bill Gleason, I guess, died suddenly. I'm not sure what of. And um, Ekman said that kind of made her reevaluate what she was doing in her life and where she wanted to go next. And so she decided not to run for a third term Hmm. in 1997. When she left office, she said her immediate plans were spending time with family, gardening, enjoying the village as a citizen, (laughs) uh, and volunteering. So I kind of think of stepping back but not out. Mm -hmm. Uh, And she was quoted then saying, I will always be on that fast track. Maybe I'll have a 20-hour day rather than a 26-hour day. (laughs) And so I I did ask her, um, and we communicate all via email, Mm -hmm. um, what was the hardest part of being mayor and what was the most enjoyable? And I think I touched on the enjoyable just a bit. But she said the village had to work through some difficult issues and build a consensus with the board and community was not easy. The goal was to find a solution that was best for the community, and not everyone agreed with the final outcome. The meetings were long and intense and caused many sleepless nights. Mm. She actually has a park named after her in Libertyville. Joanne Ekman Park was dedicated in 2006. It's in the Concord at Interlake subdivision, which is near Butterfield and Winchester Mm. Roads. She is currently Special Projects Coordinator for World Business Chicago um, and does local and international event planning for them. Um, and recently actually relocated to Chicago from Libertyville. I was just going to ask if she's yeah. still in Libertyville, but yeah. she's now in the city, huh? Right. Um, fairly recently. Um, you know, she says, like most empty nesters, we moved to the city to be closer to our children and now our four grandchildren. And she takes great joy in being with them. And I asked her, are there things you miss about Libertyville? And she said that Libertyville will always be a special place for me. I spent 15 plus years working on community issues, and it's a place where my husband and I raised our family and managed our business. It was a great community in 1977 and remains so today. Yeah. Wow. So let me ask you, what what do you think should be sort of our our takeaway by looking at these three women and uh, you studying these women and their place in Libertyville's history? Well, I think when we look back at history, we always think, you know, if you've seen the movie Pleasantville, suburban community, yep. women raising the kids. And, the men go off to work right. and the women take care of the home. Exactly. And that's, that's where it ends. Yeah. yeah. But looking at liberal history over its lifetime, um, that's not true in Libertyville. Mm-hmm. Um, there have always been women running businesses, serving on boards, you know, running community organizations. And these three women are just examples of those. Yeah. Well, what I find really interesting, actually, is kind of related to what you're saying, is that we've just highlighted these three women uh, who either are firsts or did something in Libertyville um, that was uh, unique as far as being a woman. Uh, But it doesn't seem like even at the time, even the women themselves weren't thinking of themselves as like necessarily like pioneers or the first women. They were just sort of they happened to be women who wanted to do these jobs or even fell into these jobs. Yeah, I would agree with that. It wasn't like Joanne Ekman was out there saying, elect me, I'd be the first female mayor. I want to break the glass ceiling, yeah, of Libertyville. She just saw a job that she thought needed to be done and had an idea of how it could be done and put herself out there as a person who could get it done. Yeah, which uh, I guess, you know, for future uh, leaders of Libertyville, I I mean, I think part of Women's History Month is kind of highlighting these important things and showing uh, the amazing things that women can do even at the local level. Uh, Jenny, I just want to thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. These uh, past is present local history podcasts are always uh, so much fun and so enlightening. So thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. All right. So I hope you enjoyed that local touch to Women's History Month. And even more, we hope it inspires you to dig even deeper this month into the experiences and achievements of women in this country and around the world. We would love to help you with that exploration. There's a lot of different ways you can do that through the library. To get started, don't forget to take a look at this episode's show notes, where we've linked to some of the blog posts Jenny mentioned on the episode. Those posts are on the library's blog, Shelf Life 
where we regularly write about local history, but also post book recommendations, genealogy tips, and so much more. That blog can be found at shelflife.cooklib.org. Also, make sure you head over to our website, cooklib.org, to search for books, movies, music, articles, events, or any other ways our library can help you find the resources you are looking for. And before we go, don't forget that if you have any questions or you just want to get in touch with us, you can reach us anytime. You can talk to us on Twitter at Cook Library, or you can send us an email. Send those messages to webmaster at cooklib.org. If you enjoyed this episode, please spread the word by sharing it with others. Let them know that they can catch all future episodes of the Cook Memorial Public Library podcast by subscribing in Apple Podcasts or anywhere that they like to get their podcasts. And if you really want to help us out, consider leaving a brief rating on Apple Podcasts. Those ratings go a long way in getting this show out to new listeners. We will be back soon, but until then, keep reading, keep watching, and keep listening. Keep listening.